Hello and welcome back to The Scriptures Are Real. I'm your co-host, Lamar Neumeyer, and this is Carrie Mulestein. Hi, how are you? Good, great to be back with you again. And uh, it's a good time, it's February, it's, uh, we're doing a little Come Follow Me, following along. Yeah. And I wanted to just pull this up here real quick. Well, I'm going to talk about this. We're going to talk right now, uh, we just talked earlier about uh, about the covenant relationship and, and Abraham and so forth. We're going to talk about chapter 27 now. And this is kind of a, it's kind of a weird thing. It's something that we don't quite fully understand, but it trips up a lot of students of the Old Testament. And um, we're going to talk about the birthright. First of all, before we get into the birthright, um, why is the birthright so important? especially in these ancient cultures? That's a great question. And it's something that I think we misunderstand um, as a, a, just a modern culture, partially because we let the world influence us so much. So from the world's point of view, leadership is all about the person who's leading and their power and their prestige. Whereas from God's point of view, leadership is about service. And serving others, even the Savior, when when uh, James and John say they want to be on his right and his left hand, he says, "You don't get it. Uh, this is really uh, you're, you're thinking like the princes of the world who want a lot of uh, authority, but he that is least among you shall be the greatest." Right. So that's the Savior's definition of leadership: is to, to be the the least, to be the servant. And the birthright child has the responsibility to take care of everyone else in the family, and that's why they're given a double inheritance. So if someone gets uh, sold into slavery or bondage, they're supposed to buy them back. If they lose their land, they're supposed to buy them back. If, if a spouse dies, they take care of the other spouse. They take care of the mother when the father dies and all of these things. So there's a lot of taking care of that they need to do. And so the birthright um, becomes uh, uh, really a, a, the, the extra endowment of abilities to be able to do that. And it's it a responsibility. Seems- that's exactly right. A responsibility to serve. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it seems like maybe right, when we read a lot of things into these stories here in Genesis that we're not 100% sure of, but it seems like based on this story uh, a little bit and, and a little bit some others, that there may be kind of the financial, um, uh, temporal leadership role where you're taking care of people temporarily and there, there uh, is a spiritual leadership role that are typically combined, but maybe can be separated out a little bit. Uh, I, it's not entirely clear on that one, but some, some have supposed so. Right. That's great. So th- there's a, there's a responsibility on the firstborn. Part of it is, uh, is as far as the financial part is part of is called primogeniture, where you try to keep the family's wealth together instead of just spreading it out and spreading it out to where nobody has anything. You try to keep at least the house going. And that's part of the responsibility of the firstborn to do that. So the, 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 the lands and everything, you know, transfers down to the next, uh, you know, the next uh, son and so forth. That's part right. of it. But but you're talking about the spiritual part, which is now there's blessings and things like that. You know, the patriarch and kind of hands down. So there's there's several different components to there, but it doesn't always follow the firstborn. I mean, uh, see, oftentimes it skips over or for whatever reason, the firstborn um, doesn't get it. Like Nephi is a good example. Nephi is is, um, you know, his he has two older brothers and. And uh, they don't follow the right way. So, you know, it lands to him to, to take care of the family and do that. So anyway, yeah, in fact, it's, it's a theme. If you think about it in the first uh, part of, of the Bible and the, the, what we call the Torah or the Pentateuch or mm-hmm. so on, the first five books, um, actually, in no case does the birthright <laughs> pass to the oldest son. In uh. zero cases, it's always to a younger son, oh, whether that be Abraham that. or Isaac or Jacob or Joseph or Moses, uh, it always goes to a younger son. So it seems to be an emphatic statement to say, this is going to be about who will do what they should with their, their uh, opportunity to serve, not about who is firstborn. Although still the default position is firstborn and that's how it's going to uh, go quite frequently. Right. Now, as the second born son, maybe I noticed this more. I don't know, but, uh, <laughs> but, too, that's, so. Uh, so there you are. but, but that, uh, it really is a theme in those first five books because it, 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 birthright is an issue repeatedly and repeatedly it doesn't go to the firstborn. That's interesting. I hadn't really thought of it in those terms, but, uh, yeah, that's a good insight. Okay. So that's a little bit about uh, the birthright and why it's important. Now, here's the funny thing. We have this, this story about uh, Isaac, and he's old now, 
and he can't mm-hmm. see very well. And uh, and he, he loves Esau, by the way. But for whatever reason, he really is a fan of Esau. He likes his food. Yeah, maybe boy, he's... that's tasty meat he brings him, right? <laughs> he he right. loves he loves this Texas barbecue that he gets uh, from <laughs> Esau. <laughs> that's right. So and he likes all that, and maybe that to him that's a he's a great hunter and provider. Maybe there's some of that in there as well. You know, he, right? And providing he, for the family is a real deal, right? That's, that's an right. important yeah. thing. They're nomadic people, so yeah, bringing home. Bringing home the bacon, so to speak. Although, yeah, not, not bacon for, in this game. <laughs> bringing, home, bringing home the venison. Bringing home the venison for them. It's very yeah. important. So he, Isaac loves Esau. And he's, it's time for him to give a blessing to his children. He's getting older. He, he doesn't have very good eyesight anymore. And they pulled this little trickery on him. And when I used to teach teach the, teach the Old Testament to uh, summary students, it's like, How did this, he's a cheater. How do we end up with this cheat? He cheated on that. So, um, so let's tell the story. Explain to us a little bit about if, you know, for those of us who are following along, what happens here? We go, he goes in and, and, and this isn't just Jacob on his own doing this. Uh, Jacob and Esau are twins, by the way, in case you haven't followed that so far, they're twins and they're born very close to each other. And, and one holding onto the hand of the other or the ankle yeah. of the other. Right. So that's just one birth right after the other. And it says they yeah. struggled in the womb. So they're, yeah, it's not like he's that far removed. Right. We're talking seconds, minutes, whatever that might be. And he, and uh, so anyway, for some reason, um, Rebecca decides to conspire with Jacob to pull this whole thing off. So they're supposed to go in there and receive their blessing from Jacob, or excuse me, from Isaac. And instead of Esau going in first, they dress him up in this hairy garment. Uh, Esau is yeah. known to be a hairy guy. And they send him in there and Isaac puts his hand and blesses him as if he was Esau. All right. So, Carrie, what the heck? Yeah. What the heck is going on in this deal? And you're right. It does feel like, hey, this is fishy. And why are we basing being uh, uh, the chosen people and our ancestry being descended from Jacob? And this is also wonderful when his ability to, to have the leadership comes from being sneaky right yeah, and right. and i find that my students when i teach this uh, section of of chapters we have to deal with this before we can talk about anything else because they they can't listen to anything else they just want to get feeling settled about this before they can move on and feel agreed like they can talk about anything else um now it, it is interesting because while jacob will get the birthright and in theory that means he'll inherit all of isaac's stuff he has to run away and he doesn't inherit any of isaac's stuff esau ends up with all of it um and that's where we get this. Well, he, he, he Jacob ends up with kind of the spiritual leadership part and so on. But anyway, it's interesting. So we can't. The problem is we can't read the minds of these people in the past. Uh, so we have to kind of uh, read between the lines and pull out every little clue we can from the scriptural text, right? And we're going to start out with things that we know about these people. So first of all, we've already talked about Rebecca. We love Rebecca. Rebecca is one of the finest individuals we meet in the Old Testament. I, I just think the world of Rebecca. So I'm going to assume good motives to Rebecca. I know so. everyone has their own faults, right? And so even the best of people can have uh, things that aren't perfect, but I'm still going to assume pretty good motives to Rebecca. And Agreed. we also know that Rebecca has been told by the Lord before they were born who was going to be the birthright child. So if we jump back to chapter 25, verse 23, we get this story. And the Lord said unto her, when, when uh, she feels the children struggling in her womb, that's verse 22, verse 23, the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb. And two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. The younger. So from the beginning of their lives, God has let Rebecca know who is supposed to receive the birthright. No, I'm I'm gonna just kind of assume, but it's not a real strong assumption. I'm not confident in this assumption, but I'm gonna kind of assume that at some point she shares some of this somewhere with Isaac or that the Lord shares it with Isaac or something. I, I don't know, right. but Isaac probably has some idea of what's supposed to happen. And it may be just uh, as Isaac, who also I look up to Isaac, fantastic. You know, he's my great, great, great grandfather, like Rebecca's my great, great, great grandmother, right? Uh, look up to both of them. Uh, but it may be as he's getting older, he just can't quite get himself over how good the barbecue is. That's um, right. And uh, and he just uh, is influenced by that to where he's, he, he maybe is forgetting what it is that uh, he's supposed to do in terms of these blessings. 
Yeah, right. And remember also that um, Rebecca waited 20 years to have these two sons. Yeah. She was barren for 20 years. So here she's a beautiful woman. She goes and is married and is supposed to, she's their, their prob, um, their promise that they're going to be, uh, you know, nations come from them. And she waits 20 years to have kids. Now, if you've ever uh, had this uh, friend or if you, you've experienced it yourself and if you try to have kids and you couldn't have kids for a period of time, that's very distressing. So she's had a lot of time to think about this. Yeah. And it's a story and, we find repeated in the in the Old Testament. Yeah. The, this whole that so many of the, the people who are important come from mothers who initially had not been able to have children and they need that miracle in their life. Right. And you're right. I mean, I've seen it with. Um, close friends. I've seen it with very close family members, even with some of my children who want desperately to have children and it's not happening. And it's heartbreaking. I can't think of anything that just kind of tears at the soul of both parents, but especially that, that uh, wanting to be a mother, uh, it tears at their heart and their soul. And it's, it's uh, as heart wrenching to think as I've seen those who I'm close to go through. Right. So anyway, I just want to bring that out that I, I don't think Rebecca does this flippantly. She's had a lot of time to think about this, and she's told this, that she has two nations in her womb at the time, and she knows what's going to happen. So I, I'm with you. I think let's ascribe good motives to her for whatever reason. I'm not sure why it goes down this way. I'm not sure yeah. why it had to go down this way, but yeah. that's, that's what happens, and, uh, and he gets the birthright. Yeah, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to ascribe too bad of things to Isaac. No. But what I do know is that Rebecca absolutely knows what's supposed to happen, and she is trying to find a way to make what she knows is supposed to happen, happen, which is what happens so often with all of us. Like, Hey, wait, I know this is supposed to go this way and people aren't doing things the way it seems like we need to, if we're going to make this happen. So what do I need to do to, to bring about what the Lord has told me needs to happen? Right. And that's, that's right. where I see Rebecca in this. And I assume Jacob as well. I assume she's told Jacob something about this, right. um, but I don't know. We also know a little bit about Esau. Um, Esau it has by this point in the story, Esau has some problems, right? Oh, yeah, right, right. Um, go ahead. No, I was going to say, uh, we, first of all, let's jump back to the beginning of, of Rebecca. The reason why um, Abraham goes out there, and we, we talked about this, but the reason why Abraham goes and finds Rebecca is he's in a land where he doesn't have anybody of the covenant people. And it's very important for them to be in the covenant. And we talked again about, you know, uh, about marrying outside the covenant. And remember, eternity's long, so... If someone marries outside the covenant, they're not lost forever. We're just saying in this particular case, the covenant is very important. So Rebecca is found to fulfill that covenant person. And so she understands the importance of, of being a covenant people. And Esau has already married outside the covenant. So he's already showing that he's not staying in the covenant. It's important to stay in the covenant in this case. Yeah. And, and I mean, I wish I knew more about Rebecca's story and so on, because she's coming from Abraham's family, the, the part of the family that didn't come with him. So they're of the covenant line, but they weren't really fully keeping the covenant. Right. Yet she seems to have come down to this covenant family and fully gotten into the covenant. And my guess is the covenant is particularly precious to her, very, very precious to her. And so it breaks her heart uh, I mean, it, and it says it does both Isaac and Rebecca. If we look at chapter 26, when uh, verse 34, right at the end of chapter 26, when Esau was 40 years old and he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, and uh, Bashamoth, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. And then it says, which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebecca. Yes. Right. They, they, it's just really difficult for them to see him marrying outside of the covenant. Right. Yeah, that's great. That's a great point. It, that it's the covenant. Abraham's been promised about this covenant, and I has been drilled into Isaac that you are the covenant people. You have to be in the covenant. And so Esau's breaking that. And he's he's the first in line, right? So this is yeah. not good. Yeah, it's a problem because what it means is that if the birthright goes through him, his children, nah, that's a difficult issue. Now, right. I want to say I don't fully understand why the covenant can't go through some people at this point. I, I I really don't get that. We know that's the case, but I don't know why. And I guess I'm just going to have to wait until uh, the big video in the sky to understand that. <laughs> well, um, I have a big Q&A sometime. I'm like, why does it work this way and not other ways? And sometimes yeah. it's this way and sometimes it's that way. So we don't yeah. know that. 
Yeah, I had a friend who said, you know, uh, okay, I, I kind of picture when we die, there are going to be booths with people there. Then who, who's the first one I'm going to go to ask? You know, I've got some questions I want to ask Joseph Smith. I've got some questions I want to ask Abraham. So right. I hope I hope they're in the booths right there at the front. But anyway. Um, <laughs> and, oh, and one other point while we're on this. first, So Jacob marries outside the covenant. Or excuse me. Esau marries outside the covenant, first of all. And the other thing is, is we already know what he thinks of his birthright. Right. But let's go back just to one more chapter to 25. That's exactly right. Uh, 25, um, uh, chapter 25, verse 29. And Jacob uh, sawed pottage and Esau came from the field and he was faint. So Jake's been there and he's making some food and, and uh, Esau comes in. And he's like, oh, give me some of that great pottage, that red pottage. I don't know if that's great, but it must be great. Yeah. Uh, for I'm faint and, and um, he's faint. So he's not, he's feeling it. And Jacob says, hey, give me your birthright. I don't know if this was a setup or maybe it was a, a common talk around the dinner table. Right. I, we don't really know. It seems pretty flippant at the time, but maybe yeah. there's more into it. Yeah, I'm going to assume again that that uh, Rebecca has told Jacob, hey, you're supposed to have the birthright, and it doesn't look like it's going down that way, right? <laughs> right so this right. seems to be the first attempt. And this is part of why some people think, well, there are two different parts of the birthright, and Jacob obtains the kind of like uh, economic aspect here, but he's also still supposed to get the leadership one because we've got that whole servant part. I, I, yeah. I, we're, we're reading into a lot into it to come to those conclusions, but those are the conclusions people usually come to. Yeah. And in verse, uh, verse 32, now, now this is interesting in verse 32, I don't know if Esau is super dramatic or, or maybe he is going to die, but Esau said, behold him at the point I die. And what yeah. shall it profit me for this birthright? Is he? I mean, he's really he's he's starting. Is he? Really yeah. Well, I, it really is hard to believe that he's going to die if he doesn't if he has to wait an extra half an hour for food. <laughs> for right. Fun. right. Mean, that, that it seems unlikely if he's walking in at this point that that he really is that close to death. Maybe I'm wrong, but it does seem like maybe a little bit of drama queen here. But maybe. Uh, but I should well, be careful. Esau is is a my you know he's our he's cousin, a mighty so. guy. Yeah. He, yeah. He's good. So anyway, he is of of the. Uh, lineage of Abraham. So we want to treat him nicely. Yeah. Um, but he says, and Jacob said, swear to me this day. And he swear unto him and he sold his birthright to Jacob. So in his mind, whether he was serious about it or not, we can probably infer a couple things from this, that he wasn't taking the, the, the birthright, um, the responsibility we talked about before of the birthright seriously enough. And maybe that's part of it too. And Rebecca sees this it's, and, and they all see this, that he's, He's really not living up to the responsibility that's going to fall on this birthright, the spiritual responsibility to lead this family and to grow the family and to be the progenitor of thousands of millions. That's, that's a billion yeah. people. So yeah, or more. So anyway, so in verse 20, uh, in chapter 25, we understand he sells his, his birthright for pottage. And the next one um, in, in 26, you pointed out some things there. So we already kind of know what the dynamics are. So Maybe. Yeah, now maybe I'd like to touch just a little bit more on that yeah. pottage thing, just because I have a couple. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, please. A couple things I'd like to read uh, from uh, President Oaks and President Monson on this. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, where they they see a lot of symbolism behind this story of uh, whether or not they, uh, you know, you you keep you sell your birthright for a mess of pottage. Mess of pottage. Right? Mm -hmm. So President Oaks um, in uh, General Conference in 1985, uh, uh, no, yeah, General Conference 1985, he says this, the contrast between the spiritual and the temporal is also illustrated by the twins Esau and Jacob and their different attitudes toward their birthright. The firstborn Esau despised his birthright. That's a quote from the verse we just read. Jacob, the second twin, desired it. Jacob valued the spiritual while Esau sought the things of this world. When he was hungry, Esau sold his birthright for a mess of pottage. Behold, he explained, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do me? Many, this is the part we all need to pay attention to. Many Esau's have given up something of eternal value in order to satisfy a momentary hunger for the things of the world. There's a really powerful lesson for us in there. Indeed. It also helps us understand a little bit more of the difference between Esau and Jacob, um, but there, there's a, a powerful lesson in there. This is from uh, President Monson. Uh, this is in General Conference in 1983. Some foolish persons turn their box backs, sorry, they turn their backs on the wisdom of God and follow the allurement of fickle fashion, the attraction of false popularity, and the thrill of the moment. Their course of conduct resembles the disastrous experience of Esau, who exchanged his birthright for a mess of pottage. And what are the results of such, such action? 
I testify to you that turning away from God brings broken covenants, shattered dreams, and wrecked lives. Doesn't that fit so well into what we've been talking about here? Exactly. Broken covenant. We're talking about the Abrahamic covenant here. Yeah. It's a big thing. It's a big thing. And then he continues. He says, we are of a noble birthright. Eternal life is the kingdom of our uh, eternal life in the kingdom of our father is our goal. Such a goal is not achieved in one glorious attempt, but rather is the result of a lifetime of righteousness and accumulation of wise choices. And of course, we can all be forgiven, right? Esau yeah. could overcome this and, and be forgiven and so on. But it's telling us it, it's setting the scene for uh, why uh, Jacob is doing what he's doing and Rebecca is doing what she's doing and so on. So now let's let's kind of recast our scene. It seems like um, we've got Rebecca and Jacob know that Jacob is supposed to receive the birthright and maybe mm -hmm. Isaac as well. And really Esau's already said Jacob can receive the birthright. And yet it still seems like Isaac is going to give Esau the birthright blessing. Right. And so it would seem that Rebecca is recognizing this and is saying, I need to do something about this. And uh, it may be like we see in uh, any number of families, and uh, I'm ashamed to admit too frequently my own, where um, the wife has to give her husband a, a gentle and sometimes not so gentle nudge to get him to do <laughs> the things that he knows he's supposed to do anyway. Right. And that, right. that seems to me to be what's, what's happening here so that we get this story where she says to to Jacob, go in and uh, and dress up like uh, your Esau and talk like your Esau, and uh, and we do get uh, Isaac. He he he, he kisses him and he smells him and he then he blessed him. And uh, here's the let's read the blessing. It's chapter twenty seven, verse twenty eight and twenty nine. Therefore, God give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth, the plenty of corn and wine. These all are elements of the Abrahamic covenant, right? Let people serve thee. That's in the Abrahamic covenant. Nations bow down to thee. That's in the Abrahamic covenant. But it's also certainly part of what Rebecca was told would happen, that Jacob yes. would receive this blessing, right? Mm -hmm. And let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Okay, so that's exactly, that's, he's now referring to Esau, though he thinks he's referring to Jacob bowing down to Esau, but he's now referring to Esau bowing down to Jacob, which is exactly what Rebecca had been promised would happen. Mm -hmm. um, cursed be everyone that curseth thee, and blessed be everyone that blesseth thee. That's the Abrahamic covenant, right? All of that is language from the Abrahamic covenant. Um, and then when when Isaac realizes um, it, that he's been tricked, we get in verse 37, and Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy Lord, and all his brethren have I given him to him for servants. And with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? We have to remember that, I mean, this is a blessing given by the power of the priesthood, which has the ability to seal a blessing and also to break a blessing. Mm -hmm. If Isaac at this point wanted to, and, and this is, we only know this from a Latter-day Saint perspective, but, but we know that if Isaac wants to break that blessing and give that blessing to Esau, he can. Uh, and so I have to read into this that he's saying, okay, that didn't happen the way I was planning, but I can see that's the way it's supposed to happen. Yeah, right. um, and and so he lets this blessing stand, uh, despite uh, it, this may be where finally his head gets the better of his heart or something like that, and he and he d does what he knows he's supposed to do, even though there's part of him that just really wanted to do this for Esau, and I I totally get that. Uh, I mean, there are things that I know for my kids, like I know it would be better for this, but man, my heart really wants to help them in this way, even though right. it's probably not the best way to help them. I really want to. And, and so on. And, and so I can, I can understand being a conflicted father and I suspect that's what's going on here. And then in the end, we know what the will of the Lord was, and we know that that's what happened. It's prophesied right. that it's what will happen. It is what happens. And apparently uh, Isaac and Esau just needed uh, a little help to get there. <laughs> I agree. So, so I guess our, our, the takeaway, at least for me, is this is the way the Lord wanted it for whatever reason. And again, going back to some of the things we talked about before, the four C's or five C's or six C's, I mean, that we don't have the complete story. We don't know what covenants they were under, but for whatever reason, the Lord engineered this to happen this way. Rebecca knows about it. It's already been told in, verse, in chapter 25 that it's going to be this way. And for whatever reason, and we see how Esau has treated the, the birthright in the covenants. It's not right. So I know it seems unfair, but this is the way that it determined. And it turns out all right. Esau, 
Esau doesn't go hungry. He's okay. He's going to yeah. live. He ends up with plenty. Uh, he, he ends, ends up, with, up yeah. with all of the wealth. He ends up with plenty of power and wealth and sure. so on. And, and the Edomites, uh, his descendants and the Israelites often work together. Sometimes the Israelites control the Edomites, but later on the Edomites survive and they inherit the land and the, the uh, Israelites are kicked out. And are so it, out. It, it, you get this kind of dance back and forth between them, just like was happening in between Esau and Jacob, that, that even in the womb, that dance yeah. between the two keep going, right? <laughs> That's right. He's not very happy about it. He swears to kill Jacob. That's not a good thing. No, no. And that will set up some other, you know, high drama in, in future episodes, but. Which is uh, why right. Jacob ends up leaving. He ends up leaving and leaving everything with, with uh, Esau because, well, his dad, his brother's really mad. So. Yeah. And he's going to kill him. He's so, uh, <laughs> Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, you're, you're right in a way it doesn't seem fair, but if it had happened the other way, if it had happened where, um, it's prophesied that Jacob will receive the birthright blessing. Uh, we see Esau despising it and selling it. We see Esau marrying out of the covenant and then Esau still gets the birthright blessing. That wouldn't seem very fair either. Right. That's so correct. the unfortunate part is that, uh, that the right thing happened, that it didn't happen in just the smoothest way. Right. It would have been perfect if Isaac would have just said, sorry, Esau, I need to give this to Jacob. Um, and, and so while it is in the end fair, the, the, what did happen, the way it happened maybe wasn't fair, but sometimes because of our imperfections, things have to happen in that uh, somewhat uncomfortable way. And that's one of the things I love about the Old Testament is it, it, it paints this picture for us, right? I look up to Isaac and I can see that even Isaac needed his wife to help him get where he needed to go. And that makes me feel better about the times that uh, I need my wife to help me get there. You're right. We're, we're all flawed individuals and the Old Testament doesn't hide the flaws. It tells you right, right where people did things that we don't understand or we don't know why. Um, but uh, things will work out and I think things will work out for us too. We're all flawed individuals. Things don't work out the way we plan sometimes. And sometimes people do, do and say things that we think is not fair. And even if they might be leaders in the church, we still might think that's not fair. But things work out and we just stick to the covenant and, and, uh, and things will work out okay. Yeah, I agree. All right. Well, that kind of wraps up our, uh, our chapters 25 to 6, 27. And, um, and I guess that'll do us for this time. And by the way, thanks for wearing the, uh, the scriptures are real um, uh, uh, dress code here. We yeah, both the, had to, the blue, shirt. <laughs> the blue <laughs> shirts. <laughs> Very good. Anyway, side note, but uh, it's great being with you, Carrie. I always enjoy uh, our talks. And I like learning more about these things. I hope for the people at home who are listening and or watching I've also got a lot out of this uh, this little chat, and hopefully the scriptures become more real to you as you study the scriptures and as you become uh, familiar with the people and the places that, that were real. These are real people, and it really did happen. And and uh, what can we take away from that to help us in our lives? Yeah, spread spread the word. We want to help as many people as possible. So spread the word, and, and we'll help more people take it away uh, in their lives as well. Sounds great. Well, we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us. Today.